Bird, 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 bird. Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. You are in for part two. I guess it would be like the history of my dogs, okay? We got to also, <clears throat> always, sorry, last week's was very short. This one will be short, but I got to I gotta kind of fulfill, fulfill a little of contractual agreements. But I always thank and start off with my Patreon patrons. You know, all of you can write to me. Now, if all of you wrote to me on one given day, you're probably going to wait a month for me to get back with you. But <clears throat> when you become a patron, you always get a little note back from me, and it says, and I, I hand type it, but it's the same thing all the time, you know, depending on my punctuation. Thanks for your support, and let me know if you need anything. And what that means is there might be some discounts on some things that aren't published, and people do ask me, okay? Or at least I tell them where they should go to get it. Or uh, there's a little guidance on top of everything else besides the published ones that I, I put out there. Oh, and I do want to make a retraction. Uh, by the time this episode comes out, <clears throat> the next Zoom room should have been done. And uh, for those of you who are Zoom roomers who, who come, and that's what you are when you're a patron and you get the notification that on, you know, two Thursdays a month I get together, we have a few drinks, a few smokes, a few laughs, share a few stories. Last week I told a story that Roof and I got the calculator out while we were on the phone, <clears throat> and I, I came up with somewhere around that I drank a quarter million beers, like 225,000 beers. And then one of my patrons had his calculator. He goes, Ron, uh, uh, unless you started drinking when you were 14... And I didn't. <clears throat> I was a late bloomer with a lot of things. Trust me, you hard to believe. A guy like myself being a late bloomer. Um, but I was. And, uh, and I got that. I was telling Roof about it. Everybody knows that hears me lately or knows me. Like literally every morning since COVID started over one and three quarter years ago or one and a half years ago, <clears throat> my best buddy Roof and I, now he doesn't go into the office, he cruised the neighborhood. He calls it Neighborhood Watch, and he has a coffee, and I have a coffee and a cigar, and we, we talk almost every morning like like two old hens, you know, um, sitting under perches. And uh, he reminded me, though, I got the math wrong. So the math was conservatively, we did like 8 times 7 times 4 times 52 times 45, all that. It was 125,000 beers. It was not a quarter million. Even I could have probably not drank a quarter million beers in my life without really trying. But it was a safe estimate based on growing up, traveling, and, and, a, and a real honest look at myself. So we, we, we went with a, you know, what was a safe number that I knew that not every day I drank that much, but enough days I did and enough days I didn't. We came up with the, the, the multiplier, and it was 125,000 beers, okay? Where I had the quarter million, 220, we conservatively said between the price of beer when we started, the price of beer today, and all the airports and all the travel and all the taverns and all, the, all that kind of stuff, it was safe to say that I spent $2 a beer on those beers. So... That's where I got the quarter million. So I did not drink a quarter million cans of beer in my life. It's safe to say I drank 125000 and have spent a quarter million dollars on beer. <laughs> I, I, I just, that was one of them, uh, what do they do? They got to clear up the, you know, it's a uh, retraction, a bit of a retraction for, for at least those of you who came on the Patreon Zoom a couple weeks ago. Pike Gear, my title sponsor, uh, if you haven't gotten that Tongas top with the quarter zip, the pocket, and the orange sleeves, you know, the weather is still so mild. That's what I'm wearing. You know, I, yes, I have a vest. Of course I have the vest. But, I mean, I'm wearing that for chores around the house, you know, especially here. You know, we're coming up on rifle season here. 
uh, might be rightful season where you're at. And I'd rather just have some orange on me. You know, the stranger things have happened. Check out Pike Gear's lineup. Three different kinds of pants, tops, shirts, more stuff coming out in 2022 that I'm not allowed to tell you about. Uh, an episode that I'll be doing with Brent after his uh, ptarmigan hunt with Nick Hoffman. Nick went to get a moose somewhere in, uh, I don't know, was it Iceland? No, somewhere out there. No, It was, it was out of this country. Um, we're going to bring him out. We're going to talk about the, the, the ptarmigan hunt. We're going to have Nick come on. Nick's... Nick's been on the show before. He's got a Cocker Spaniel. We'll talk a little Cocker talk, uh, all that fun. I told you before, Tom Davis. By this time, you know, I might have already recorded that one with Tom. Chad Mendez, UFC fighter, and Chad Belding, uh, renowned duck hunter. And, uh, uh, well, you know, everyone knows. In the, in the, if you're in the duck world, you know the name Chad Belding. And Chad Mendez got together and did a cookbook. I've got that. I've been going through it. It's, it's one of them books I like because it's got the stories with it and the pictures. You know, recipes are recipes, but sometimes a little story, you know, makes, makes the difference. And it's a great book, so they're going to be scheduled to come on. But, again, this is part two of the history of my dogs. So we've got to finish up with Onyx. Know where you stand. Know where you've been. Set a pin. Share it with a friend. Okay? Don't be stingy. All right? You don't, need to, you don't need to save all the good spots for yourself. Now, granted, if you're a Michigan grouse hunter, you may not want to share that pin. But if you're out west and you got a trip out there and you did good, mark a piece of public land. Send it to your friend. Up. Make it a little easier, okay? Everything's easier with Onyx, just like CZ. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. It's not easy to find a CZ because they're in such high demand, okay? But it's easy to get a good gun with CZ. It absolutely, positively, you buy... It's where price and quality come together, whether it's a pump, auto loader. I love their 1012. Absolutely. Uh, the last one I, the last auto loader I had is when Beretta was a sponsor. And I still, last time I used that gun, I, I just grabbed it. And I, I, I don't know if I'm uncoordinated or the thing's broken. It constantly jams up two shells out of the tube when I'm emptying the gun. Uh, it's probably me. But the 1012 works simple, plain. It's, you want to get an autoloader, get a 1012. I, I, that's, yeah, that's my choice. What are you going to put in the gun? Well, here, I'm sitting here <clears throat> with a box. Now, I just, you know, a couple weeks back, I was out in North Dakota and <clears throat> told you about who was out there, my, my best friend, Roof. And he is known for throwing stuff away, but then keeping some stuff that nobody would keep, all right? Now, if you ever seen a couple pictures on Instagram of my office or my uh, what I call the uh, the pump room down in Virginia, where I I have a bunch of pump guns up on a sheriff's rack and all my books and little things I collect at antique marts. I got some old paper shotgun shells and the boxes. Some in a couple cases, I've got the original box full of shells. But here's a box Roof gave me on this trip. Now he he covered it up in plastic so it wouldn't rot, like like clear plastic tape. But it's a box of federal duck and pheasant. Now, why does that sound funny? Because when this box of shells was made, we were kids. There was no ton, there was no non-tox. There, it, it didn't exist. If it did, we sure didn't know about it. There was no rules insisting that you couldn't use lead around waterfall. And this was called duck and pheasant. Number six, uh, ounce and a quarter shot, 12 gauge. Two and three quarter inches, which is all you really need. Let's be honest. You don't need three or three and a half unless you have <clears throat> a, a complex. Three and three quarter drams of powder. Eh, that was a lot. I don't remember how these gun shells kicked. I do remember how they knocked birds down, both duck and pheasant back in Illinois. Um, but that's where I'm going to boss shotgun shells. Everywhere you go. It, let's right now, if you go to Kansas... And you wanted to go dove hunting, or I'm sorry, maybe Nebraska. You wanted to go dove hunting, not on the water, just on state land. Not WMA, not wildlife management or waterfall production, just state lands that some states have now. You're going to need non-tox for that too because they don't want lead <clears throat> on that property. So what's the solution? Well, you know what it is. It's Bosch shotgun shells. That's all that's in my truck. No, I mean, Besides the deck drawer system, which holds everything, 
is boss shotgun shells. And, you know, you hear people talk about it. You hear other podcasters talk about it. You've heard me talk about the shot that Hunter took on a duck that um, was he lucky? Well, you know, give a man a little luck and anything will do for brains. But he killed the bird. And that might have happened with them old duck and pheasant number sixes back in the day when they were all lead. But it happened with boss. Bismuth, copper plated. Yeah, that was a long one for boss, wasn't it? Love you guys too. Walton's has everything but the meat. And I've got the meat. Now, I brought home, I didn't bring home a lot of birds, but I'm getting some of the ducks that Hunter and uh, his dad brought home. We're, we're coming up with some recipes. You're going to see a little cooking segment soon with the two pheasants. The last two pheasants, the pheasants I brought home, are aging now. They are, oh, well, no, but it, I'm saying this wrong. They were, they were aging for about 10 days, but it's been cool out every night. Plucked them. And I'm going to make a fantastic chicken. I'm or chicken. I'm going to make a chicken looking like. I can honestly tell you that I have plucked a few birds in my life. Not many. I'm guilty of a lot of things. Like you heard in the last episode. Breeding practices, not knowing what you're doing. Training dogs, not knowing what you're doing. Hunting birds, skin them out. Well, Jim Harrison, the author, said, <clears throat> it's a God against man and nature. Or a sin against man and nature. To, to skin a bird. And I think there's something to it. So these two pheasants are going to get prepared for the holidays, plucked, stuffed, and eaten like, like I haven't eaten in a week or two or three. And they're going to get Walton spices in and out. My dogs had Purina in and out. Well, it goes in, it comes out, but that's the beauty of Purina. It goes in, they get everything they can from it, and it goes out. Easy to clean, easy to feed. And it all fits in a gunner food crate, which is, you know, a tie. What do they call that? Uh, tying it in, bringing it around. Watch, watch, me, uh, watch me segue into that. Yeah. What, what do you put your period in besides your dog? You put it in a gunner food crate. You put your dog in a gunner kennel. You put Purina in a gunner food crate. No better combination. There, you know what? I, that's, that's, okay. I don't want to call it a lie, but that is an exaggeration. There is something that goes together better. It's Garmin, navigating and dog training. That's all in one unit from the, from the 550 plus to the Instinct Watch to the Alphas to the Garmins to the Astros. Uh, everything in canine training and navigation is all you need. Everything you need for your dog on top of good dog food, canine athlete will have. In fact, I got it for you, too, under the name Wilderness Athlete. I'm drinking one. Here, listen. I just put it in a, just put it in a Nalgene bottle, and I'm shaking it up. You know what? And it is, that's my go juice. I mean, now that's my midday, probably usually late morning at or after lunch, I, I mix up a energy and focus from Wilderness Athlete. And then the rest of the time, my dogs get canine athlete. Um, because they make that stuff taste like liver, and they make this stuff taste like uh, lemonade. So why wouldn't I? When I need anything that I can get in dog training, I go to W Supply. You should too because Jason and Buddy are there. They're, they're personal touch. You can buy gear from anywhere. You can go online, and you're going to find it for the same price. A lot of this stuff, same thing. It's MSRP controlled. They're not allowed to give you a discount. They can't give me to give you a discount, but what they can give you is service. And they sell more collars than anybody in this country. They know, they know every line, and of course they know the Garmin line, but every line. You got, you got something you like to use, the next time you need one, you give, you give them a holler. And it's double U, D-O-U-B-L-E-U. And then when you Google it, you just write in DU Supply, which implies Ducks Unlimited, but it's not. Um, the deck drawer system, again, uh, I haven't got the code, but I do believe we're going to get a free shipping code on this. If not, I could steer you to where you can get one, but I am sure that we're going to have a free shipping code. And that's, you're talking about a, a, an expense, a savings? A deck drawer system comes on a huge pallet with huge boxes. And it gets delivered by a semi. You either have to be there to unload it on your street or you have to know somebody with a factory or a distribution center where you can go pick this up. It's big. It's heavy. It's built. It's, it's built like, honest to God, it's built like a gunner kennel. It's un, you can't destroy it. Yeah. 
Shooting Sports Magazine is my magazine of choice. I, when, especially these colder days down here in Virginia, oh, my God, I can just curl up downstairs, light the wood stove, sit in this big armchair, and I read, you know, I got such a bad memory. If I pick up last year's issue, I'm like, oh, I never read this before. And then somewhere around halfway through the article, I'm like, oh, yeah, I did. I did read this before. I did. No wonder why I like this article. I read it twice. And the Upland Institute, if it... If you have anything in your dog's performance this year that you would like one little bit better, you get a hold of me, go to the Upland Institute. There's a contact page on there. You can get a hold of me and Justin. You can ask it and see if something's going to apply to your dog. You may, not, you may not think you need foundations. You may be ready for advance, or you might be ready to train and retrieve your dog. Be a better trainer. It, as you're going to hear... On this second part of this episode, the history of my dogs, I have become a better trainer. I did. I didn't have Upland Institute. It would have helped. It would have helped immensely. Oh. Anyway, here we go. Part two, part do, D-E-U-X, part do, of my history with dogs. All right, so part do, part two, whatever I called it. All right, we, where we left, last dropped off here was Donka. And Desi, actually Desi was the mom of Donka. <clears throat> and Desi is the dog that got me to be a judge. And it was not a, it was a prize three. I think the whole day was going, whoop, wait a minute. Geez, sometimes you just can't get going. The phone's ringing. My wife's coming out here. I was going to tell you at the end of this podcast how she has supported me through all of these dogs. Yet, let me know that she was not happy that I did not hook the garden hose back up even though in the wintertime you take it off the house. Anyway, anyway, Donka and Desi. So Desi was a dog I became a judge with, and it was a prize three, low score. But being an apprentice judge, I kind of knew how the scoring system was. I, I was 99% sure I passed every aspect of the test until the last segment. Now to back this up, a year before that, Desi came in. Uh, Desi was a part-time house dog, and we were, we were on the back porch and she came up to me with her eye all squinted up, like 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 she just got poked by a stick, which she did. Um, and I was like, well, what's the matter with her? What's the matter with her? And I kind of, and she was good about, you know, like looking at her teeth and her ears. She was, a, like I said, she was one of my favorite dogs ever. And I tried to open that eye up, and her third eyelid was covering her eye. And I'm like, oh, I never saw the third eyelid closed while I opened a dog's eye before. And that's you know, genetics of the dog. That's what, that's how they can run through fields and close their eyes quick and not get debris in it. Anyway, I had to go to the vet that afternoon. I remember, I think it was one of the girl's birthdays. It was either May or June. And I had to leave for the vet because there was something wrong with that eye. And Doc Zamoron got her on the table, looked at her and he said, Ron, he says she's got a, a corneal abscess. So, she must have got poked by something or had something in there. And then when it abscessed, her eyelid went over, her third eyelid went over it. And then she, like I said, came in, looked like a prize fighter. And uh, good old Doc Z, he was the, oh, the best, best vet anybody could ever have. <clears throat> he, uh, he said, well, look, he says, dog can get around with one eye with no problem. But he said, I think I can save it, but I don't want it. There's no guarantees. And I was always pretty pragmatic. I'm like, hey. I didn't go to vet school. I'm coming to you. Uh, whatever you think's the best thing to do is the thing we're going to do. He said, let me just try to do something. That eye, he, he cut out the abscess. You know, I may be getting the technics, you know, the, little, the, the medical terminology wrong. Filled the, you know, stitched the eye closed, filled it with saline. And if that didn't hold, he was going to have to take the eyeball out. All right, and just stitch it up. I said, whatever happens. Calls me up later in the day. I think it was already at night. I think he stayed late on that day. Calls me up, said, yeah, come get her. Um, don't let her run out in the dirt. Don't her eye seems to be there. It's holding its own. Anyway, she had a literally a white scar over her pupil. So meaning if you put your hand in front of your your finger in front of your right eye, you still see what's around you, but you always got this this, you know, dark spot, right? 
But dog's eyes are set to the side a little bit. They're not like human eyes. They don't, they're not working like ours. So she had a little vision problem and, and when it came to marking. So like I could throw a bumper 50 feet, and I'm telling you, she would stop short. She depends, again, what eye she saw it with. Or, anyway, that was my anthropomorphication of why my dog couldn't mark. Mm, maybe she wasn't good before, and I didn't notice it. But here we are, last part of the test called Retrieve a Duck. It's done several different ways, but the idea is that you stand at the bank, you have your dog steady, you have a distraction shot, and then you shoot, you have a distraction shot, dog has to sit through all that, and then somebody, sometimes in a canoe or a kayak, or if a, if a chapter has a launcher, which some did back in the day, you launch this duck up in the air like a big arch, you shoot at it with your blank gun, and when it hits the water, you release the dog to go get it. Now, that's all I got to do, and I've never had a problem with her doing this thing. Now, this goes back to some friends of mine. I'll leave the names out in case I got the names wrong, but they're all good friends of mine. We were up at Traverse City, and the fellow that was doing the duck launching, you know, pulling back on them rubber bands and, you know, you're trying to get that duck to go in the same spot for every dog or, you know, about the same spot. Um, he was told that, you know what, when Ron gets up, he's last. Really pull back on them rubber bands. Just give it a little extra grr because Desi doesn't see things good and she's got to see that duck, okay? I don't think that that was necessary. The uh, should anybody be saying that at a test? No. Has it happened before? Probably. Okay. Anyway, this particular fella pulled back so hard on these rubber bands that the legs came out of the ground and forced him to let go of the duck, which meant there was no propulsion, and the duck went up in the air and landed right by the bank. Well, now I suppose I could have just asked for another duck or said, look, that that's, you know, but I wasn't thinking of it. Everybody could see the duck in the water. It was a longer retrieve than any other dog had to make. And in this part of the test, all you got to do is get the duck back to the shore. Now, ideally for everything, right to hand, right? But no, if she went out there and got that duck, even if I have to throw a rock, the idea is that you could recover that duck that you dropped in the water. That's the whole idea. The beginning part is steadiness, honoring the shots, waiting to be sent. Now, I right off the bat just said, dead bird. Because, you know, I, I thought she saw it. She went out there probably 30, 40 yards, started looking around. She never saw the, the bird splash. And if she did, going back to my assumptions are about her eye. And I took a rock and I threw it as far as I can. Now, I wasn't much of a baseball player. And the only reason I was an outfielder is because I was a right fielder and I sucked at baseball. That's really through the worst kid. You go to right field. And uh, long story short, I never had an arm, okay? And I threw a rock, and she swam out to the rock. But the wind wasn't conducive where the smell of the duck would come. And I threw another rock. And in any chapter, especially if they're, if they're prepared for this and they've been in this before, they're always going to have, by, you know, down by the water, you're going to have some rocks for people to throw. You can, there's a couple other segments where you can throw a rock, like in the duck search. doesn't going to help your score unless, it really, unless you're really struggling. But with this one in particular, sometimes that splash can get that dog out there, and you can at least pass the test with a, with a low score on the retrieve a duck. And uh, Timmy Clark is a NAVDA judge, old friend of mine. And apparently Timmy must have played outfield or something as a little leaguer. And he said, you want me to try? And I said, Timmy, come on, I, I can't get that rock halfway there, you know. I might as well be throwing with my right arm and I'm left-handed. He takes this rock, and I think the dog saw him cock his arm back and watched him go. And that son of a, son of a friend damn near hit the duck with the rock. And the dog saw the splash, got the duck, came back, bam, I'm a judge. Yeah, right there. That was how, that's Desi. Anyway, her daughter, Danka, who, of course, like I said, you know, I, I didn't know, I didn't do breed mate. I did what so many people back in the day did. I got a good dog. You got a good dog. Oh, they both got some NAVDA scores here. Um, they produced Danka. 
Now, Donka was another skinny little female wire hair, another sweetheart like her mom, but a little mischievous. She will be going on the plaque along with Desi and Cor and Hasco and Queenie and, and JD and Sandy. Um, but her claim to fame, Donka, was the fact that uh, she had a lot of talent. She would, she would shut down during heat cycles, like literally. I never saw a dog. It's another thing I learned from my dogs. Some females do, some don't. That dog would get, you, she wouldn't know her name. She wouldn't eat food. She wouldn't, uh, it was a mess, okay? But all in all, she was a good dog. And uh, I can't remember what she ended up with a score for, but, you know, I N.A. tested her. And, of course, you know, why not? We're going to, now, we're going to breed Danka at some point. I don't have the timeline history or the dates, but Danka was another sweetie. Now, she was also an escape artist, though. She could clear, as John Wayne said, could clear a four-wheel fence for that horse. And this dog could clear, or with a little effort in a running start, could go over a six-foot fence. That was the first dog I had to put a top of course, Top would have helped when Hasco kept visiting Queenie back in the day. But that was the first dog that I had to put a screen panel on top for. She would just get out at will. She'd see me pull up in the driveway. She'd back up, boom, boom, over the top, land down, land like a cat. She was a small dog. She, she, she you know, ne never hurt herself, you know, coming off of a six-foot fence. She, she had her issues, but what she was another one. When I go talk about dogs that... You can hunt anywhere. Anybody could come to the house. That's not all my dogs, okay? That's not all of them. But she was a sweetheart. In fact, you might have heard a story way back in the day. Dave, Dave Utzinger on a couple of podcasts. He loves telling a story about Donka. They were going out to Iowa. They were underdog-powered. We are all in that same category. Like, we're all making more traveling wing-shooting trips. And they were underdog-powered. And... He said, Is there, do you have any dog that, you know, you could lend us? And I, 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 think, I think Cora was still there. I knew, I knew Desi was. And Desi, well, she was a sweetheart, but I just didn't want to let Desi go. It was, you know, her eye, and uh, she was kind of my baby. Um, but Donka, yeah, Donka, she, she, was, a, she was a clown. You could, you could do tricks with her. The guys played hotel race games down the hallways with her there's you, you'll you've probably most of you've heard that episode she was another dog that goes down there is like one of my good ones you know and you heard her story with me and and todd from ukc there was some breedings done there was some good and some bad come out of it but one of the things that down my line of wire hairs came after her sired by hasco who had zero cooperation, just goes to show you every puppy doesn't get it, every puppy doesn't have it, and it doesn't pass on all the time. Zygon came along. Now, Zygon, he was, well, you know, I should back that up. Queenie was the first dog I got a, uh, a Breeders' Award with. I did. I got, a, I got four puppies from her, and... Uh, and we got a Breeders' Award for, I forget what number litter it was from her. It's the only time I, you know, I was, I was just selling dogs in the newspaper, and I think I took out a NAV to add. I, nobody knew me, didn't expect them to. But anyway, going back to Zygon. Now, I got Zygon, and people were coming over to look at pups. I wasn't going to keep a pup. I had, a, I had enough dogs. And Zygon was like the skinny, bony, uh, uh, you know, you know, ugly dog, ugly dog catalog, right? Ugly dog hunting supply. You know, they always, their wire hairs. Actually, actually, the first, Terry Wilson's first wire hair, I believe if the lineage is right, was sired by Hasco's son, who was another uncooperative son of a gun that Karen Potter owned. And that's another story. But anyway, Zygon comes along. People looked at him. They didn't want him. They wanted every puppy but him. And when I was looking at her, you know, they were, by, by this point, I think he was probably 10 weeks old. I, I'd sold all the other dogs, and I was going to sell them. And I 
being, you know, nabbed a judge, I tend to look at dog's teeth, and I was watching his bite. Didn't look, it looked like it was going to be undershot when he was like six weeks old, eight weeks old, and sure enough, it, uh, it was on its way to being classically undershot, okay? I will say that I never used him for breeding, <laughs> okay? At least, you know, every so many dogs you go with, you're like, okay, I won't do that again, but is all the, he got 68 points and no prize on his NA, and we were over in Wisconsin. But there was something about him. I saw him, I saw him go back out in the pipeline. I had a pigeon out there, and the dog, he got out of the kennel. I'm like, oh, great. He's going to go back there, grab the pigeon. I had a pigeon under one. I think it was one of them little step launchers. I don't think it was an electric launcher. But I had a pigeon out there, I, I'm saying tethered or, or const, you know, constrained. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, he's such a wild child. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. He do-. You know, I'm thinking, oh, I got Hasco's son here. Because when he was young, he showed all this lack of cooperation. For some reason, I walked out in that pipeline. I knew he had to be back there somewhere or assumed he would be. That's where I used to run my dogs, as we say. That was my exercise yard. It's a gas easement behind my property and goes through 20 other people's property. And everybody kind of uses it for recreation. And... uh I bet you it's 10 minutes later. I finally get out there. I'm calling and calling and calling. I'm like, God dang it. He's running away somewhere. What's he doing? And there he is. I could see him over by the trees just holding a point on this pigeon. And I was like, that's actually where I got his name, Zeigen. In, the, in German, the verb to point or show is Zeigen. Z-E-I-G-E-N. And in, in, in German... If the E is before the I, you pronounce the I. If it's the I is before the E, you pronounce the E. So it looks like it would be Ziegen, but it's Zeigen. And uh, we've had him called Zygon, Zygot, but his name was Zeigen. Uh, he got 68 points and no prize, but this is when I was starting to read my dogs a little bit, okay? Just like finally getting rid of those rose-colored glasses and those denials like, oh, this one's good, this one's bad. Now, there was something about him that I could, the fact that he was that young and held that point and didn't knock that pigeon out of that thing, I think it was because he felt like he didn't hit, it wasn't a training situation and it wasn't under judgment. Anyway, um, that, that's how he got his name. And a lot of my names you've heard from other dogs. There's been Queenies before and Sadies and Sandies, but tell you, there's not a lot of Zygons and I don't think there's another one. And uh, so anyway, he went on to, I don't think I UPT'd him, but I UT'd him. He didn't do great in the water, but then I did him the next year or twice that year. I can't remember the, the chronological order. Um, he got his foreign water search that day, and all we had to do was get to the same thing that Desi had to get. A, a lot of tests back in the day, uh, for whatever reason, sometimes it was because we had to travel, you had to get to a body of water where you could do the uh, retrieve a duck. And uh, I was out at the Southeast Chapter. My friends, Lisa, my Lisa and Peter Pure, they've been running that thing forever. Always loved judging there, and I always loved testing there. I love their water, their grounds, just nice place. And I'm going into this now. I've been a judge for a bit, and I know where I'm at now. I mean, I know, I know that day is four, four nose, four surge, four pointing, four this, four that, four that. Got one thing left to do, and it's retrieve a duck. <laughs> but he also <clears throat> was hands down the best retrieving dog I ever owned in my life. He was the one that I tra- he would pick up beer cans, pick up this, pick up that. He was always had something in his mouth, but not like taffy, like neurotically. He just pick it up and bring it to me. I could I could have dropped something if I had dropped a comb. He'd be standing there with the comb in his mouth. Now I did take him through the training table and in the trained retrieve, but he breezed it, just like he breezed through steadiness. Like I am not a great trainer, but in, back in that day I followed the old green book. No collar on this dog, and I'm, I'm standing there with all fours, and I ended up. I'll never forget. And John McNeil will never forget this. One of my buddies, John, I love him to pieces. He just passed his dog in the Invitational this last September. And I was there to watch it. And I was there to see him get his VC on his, uh, on his Griffin. But 
John was one of the judges that day. And John is what we would call a retrieving uh, fanatic. Um, his dogs, if nothing else, and they fail tests too, and they pass them and they fail them. John is, you know, he's, a, he's, he's his own trainer. He's not a pro trainer, just a, just a nav to judge. But gosh darn it, if he doesn't insist on some good retrieves from his dogs. And Zygon sat through the shots, sat through the, hold on a second. I don't think I've ever had that much distraction doing a podcast in my life. Honest to God. Anyway, so we're at the water. He sits through the shot, the distraction shot, or my shot, distraction. I'm sorry, distraction, my shot, distraction. Duck flies in the air. Boom, I shoot it in the air. Hits the water. I'm looking at him. I'm like, oh, we got a four now. Hit him. Goes out and gets the duck. Grabs the duck with authority. And as a lot of dogs do, he took the shortest path. He, he swam out of the pond, which dogs are allowed to do, as long as they take the water to it. And he comes whipping around this, this uh, spillway, and he's coming at me like a hell on fire, you know. He's ripping. He's bringing that duck back to me. With the, like I'd never seen him bring it back. And in a millisecond, I'm like, this dog is going to pass me by. Now, he's still going to bring me the duck. This dog is never put, remember I talk about Hasco never losing game. I'm sure he did, but the memories are all good about that. And if nothing else, Zygon would not spit a duck out or a bird without my hand there and the word out. But I got nervous in this millisecond. Now, he might have ran past me, turned right around, come back. That would have been fine. But I treated it like a line ball shortstop. And when he come running by me, I put my arm out, I grabbed the duck, and I said, out, oh! and one's felt swoop. I had a four in my opinion. Yeah, that wasn't John McNeil's opinion. That was a save. But anyway, he got himself a 201, prize one, couldn't have been prouder. Haven't done it again with another dog. Um, probably could have done it with him five times in a row if I wanted to. Took him all the way to the Invitational, which he did not pass. And half my fault, half, I think, test set up, I will say that. Um, for those of you who know, I, I've been to the Invitational once. I don't ever care to go again. It eats up an entire summer of your life for something that you already have, a fantastic prize one dog. Uh, the Invitational is a, uh, a higher level of obedience. Uh, there's no more talent. Uh, you're not, there's no more talented dog out there than a utility-tested dog that passes its utility test. And then when you get one that gets damn near a maximum score all day, you know, sure, it's not wild birds, but the obedience is spot on and matches the desire of the dog. That's about as best as you can get, the bestest as you can get. And, and Zygon was that dog. And on his invitational day, uh, some of you don't even know what this means. Some of you do. There used to be a portion of it called the shackled duck. They'd take a live mallard duck and they'd wrap it up with tape and they'd toss it out there and your dog had to go get it. And the idea was that it would paddle away, you know, but it was kind of encumbered by the tape. And then your dog had to track it and grab it and bring it to you. So for some people, that was back and forth. I remember my friend Craig Jones was at that Invitational with me. When they launched his duck, it landed on its back. Feet sticking straight up in the air, waving, like, come get me, come get me. The duck couldn't right itself and get back on its belly, and his dog swam out there, grabbed the duck, brought it back, bam, got himself a pass on that, on that portion of the test. My dog's case, this duck, either the tape came off, or it wasn't taped well, or whatever happened, this dog could outswim my dog. And we watched for almost 20 minutes as this dog, this duck swam through cattails. Minutes later, Bravo tracking it, not on eyesight, on the water with his nose. Tracked that dog right back into the cattails. And we'd wait for minutes, and I'd be standing there with the other judges. I'm like, oh, God, this is killing me. And they're all tapping me on the back. Don't worry, Ron, he's on it, he's on it, he's on it. And five minutes later, I saw this duck clear this opening again. And there he goes again, clears that opening, goes into another patch of cattails. A minute later, here comes Zygon. 
all on scent that the dog left on the water, just like they're supposed to do. And could not catch it. And they gave me as much time as they could possibly give me and just said, Ron, it's not going to happen. Um, so he did not pass the shackled duck. Later today in the field, we had an issue with backing. I blame myself, not the test. I blame myself on that one because this was a natural backing dog that backed every dog I'd ever hunted with. But like so many people make mistakes, they, they tell everybody tells you, <clears throat> you got to train with a Vishla, a Setter, a Spanoni, a Cocker Spaniel, a Lab. You got you to you train with dogs who don't point, who don't back, who have. Yeah, some of that's true. But I've learned to read dogs enough in my own. If I ever had another dog like Zygon, the last thing I'm going to do is pound it in his, to a head, in his head that he's got to back a fence post. I would keep it way more real. Um, but even say it, even if he would have got more than a two in backing at the Invitational, he still couldn't catch an unshackled duck. Anyway, that's Zygon. <clears throat> Everybody knows probably, probably my number one favorite dog that I've owned to this point in my life. But that's, that's like 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, and 1.4. He just had a personality. Now, the problem with his personality was he loved people, loved me, loved my family, didn't exactly like other dogs. And the older he got, he, that's the other lesson I learned, the this, this, this sharpness that a lot of dogs have. And it, it happens with a lot of breeds. Happens with wire hairs and drought hairs a lot more than any other breed, but this is this isn't breed specific. Along comes Frankie. Frankie is out of Zygon, and I am tickled. Frankie is everything. Is the embodiment of of Desi and Donka, and the eyes that look at you. He had a coat that was way better than his father's. It was much like his grandfather's Haskell's. It was flat land, felt like a Brillo pad. He had these beautiful furnishings on his face. This dog was a little short in stature, studly. He was on his way to showing me everything I could want. And I started feeling like, God, at least I'm, I might not be much of a better breeder, but I'm sure reading dogs better and I'm getting more out of them. And lo and behold... When Frankie got to be about two, maybe a year and a half, as soon as he felt like he was a big dog, Zygon and him got into a mortal combat. And, you know, when you're a teenager and you're fighting a, a grown man, you better be really good to beat up that old man. And Zygon, Zygon did not tolerate. And, but yet, up until this day, laid on couches, chewed on bones. I remember one time they both came back with a woodchuck in their mouth, together, tandem, across this field running across the field in tandem, each one having an end of a woodchuck together. But something happens with these dogs when the younger dog decides that I'm as good as you or I'm grown up now, and the old man says, the hell you are, not under my roof. And I ended up giving, I ended up giving Frankie to a friend, uh, to all my, my buddies, Dave and, and, and uh, uh, Bruce and Terry. They were going out to North Dakota, and they needed some dog power. I said, take Frankie with. He, he's, he's good. Some of them, he points, he holds. You're going to love him. You're going to love him. And they ran into somebody who saw Frankie and then saw him work and wanted to buy him. And they called me up and they said, do you want to sell Frankie? I said, no. I said, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm either going to have to manage a dog that will kill another dog. And it wasn't, at this point now, it's not going to be just Zygon. You know, when two male dogs fight, uh, and you, anybody can write me or call me up about this, maybe this isn't 100% of the time, but it's happened 100% of the time to dogs I know personally and other friends' dogs. Once that male and that male have squared off, you have got a problem for the rest of your life. Now, you might find another dog that looks like that dog, and, but it's not that dog, and that your male might, and I've seen it happen in a couple of females, too. But that's a whole other story for another day or for a Zoom room. Um, but I knew that it was going to be a problem with owning Frankie and Zygon. And I said, you know what? Okay, tell them. I think I sold them for $2,500. And it, it was killing me. At the same time, concurrently, I've been thinking about the Brocco breed. And... 
Oh, I, I will save the whole story. Of, I, I've told it before on a couple other podcasts, so I, I'll save the story. But I'm looking into this breed because I helped a guy with a rescue Bracco. Um, I should have known better once I got to know that dog. But in, in the whole time I'm doing this with Zygon and Frankie, a good friend of mine back in the day, John Crozier, he was a NAVDA judge from Pennsylvania, and he had a dog named Kettle Creek's Mo, and I wanted to breed to it. And it didn't work out, but I ended up breeding to another dog from that, from that litter, or from his lineage. And I ended up calling up, Scott, uh, calling up John, and I think I wanted a female, and he didn't have a female, and I got a male. And that dog's name was Tanzer, T-A-N-Z-E-R, and that was German for something I can't remember. So Frankie's gone. Tanzer was right in, the, right in the mix, same age almost. And I'm telling you, almost the same thing happened. I was in my camper. I was in Virginia early on. I had Zygon sleeping on the couch on my left, and I had Tonzer sleeping on my right. And I'm sitting there reading a magazine on a Sunday. I'm not working. My feet are up, and I'm snoring. You know, reading puts me to sleep. Still does. If, if, now, if talking put me to sleep, I obviously wouldn't have a podcast, but, uh, you know, that's not the case. So all of a sudden, I wake up to teeth snapping and mouths biting right in front of my nose. Now, how in the world that happened with two dogs that just played together? Something snapped, or one of them got up to do something. I don't know what happened, but all I know is I break into a dog fight in front of my face. And the only saving grace was I never, ever take my collars off a dog. My daughters do it. Both of my daughters do it. Drives me nuts. I go to grab a dog, there's no collar on it. If there's no collar on my dog, it's because I was washing it because it got full of, you know, horse shit or something that it rolled in, or if I was just happened to be putting a tag on it. Or there's always a collar on my dog's necks, and being, you know, I'm not saying I'm that strong, but I'm pretty damn strong. I've been working my entire life with steel conveyor racks, beams, mezzanines, I beams, drift pins, wrenches. I had those two dogs in front of me, like two pitchers of water, by their collars, still trying to go together and, and attack. And I literally held them two off and literally got to the door of the camper, which was, you know, camper's only six feet wide. Held them two while they're still trying to kill each other, scaring the piss out of me. I hit that lever lock on that camper door up with my left foot, Took Zygon, and, and he was an 80-pound dog. And with my left arm, just pitched him right out the door. He hit the ground, turned around to come back in, and I grabbed that door and closed it right before he could come back in that kennel. And you talk about, like, oh, again, again, I got to get. Why is this happening to me? Well, it's the dogs, and it was that dog. Now, You've heard me tell stories about Zygon. I did an episode a couple years ago when he went down. It brought a lot of tears to my eyes. Dog had everything I loved except he couldn't be around another male dog. So Tonzer is still going to go down on my board. Frankie's certainly going to go down on my board. I didn't get to keep them until they died, but I know where they were when they died. I, I kept track of them. Frankie lived out a great life. Tonzer ended up going to my friend's down in Virginia, and it was a young couple that I met through the plant, and uh, I remember because they heard about me training in the area, and we had some NAVDA stuff we were doing with uh, with my buddy Matt and uh, and Wade, so word was getting around. We'd been training dogs, and these people heard through the plant that, you know, I train dogs or work with training dogs, not a trainer, and uh they heard I had some birds. I had access to birds. I had the best situation in Virginia that anybody could have. I literally, my trailer for the first year was parked behind what they call a poultry barn. And this guy converted his poultry barn to raising chuckers, quail, pheasants, and ducks. It was like, it was like he wanted to have his own NAVDA chapter, but he was just doing it. The ducks for duck meat, the pheasants for a, a, a pheasant farm, and a quail and chucker for some field trailers he knew. It was crazy. So I had everything you could ever want, except two male dogs that could get along. 
And uh, so I gave that dog to Tonzer to them. They had a Weimaraner at, the, at this point, and uh, it, it just, I think it came from a show stock. You know, they, we took it out, we planted some quail. And I'm like, all right, well, here, let's go plant a couple more quail out. And I took Tonzer out of the box, and, and the dog could run like, Tonzer could have been used to run down coyotes. I'm telling you what, that was the fastest running, longest striding, longest legged, not, not really longest legged, but proportionally, the dog was a bullet. Um, and he would always run and just slam them points because he was always going so fast. And these, oh, this guy, he was just going absolutely, absolutely ballistic. You know, after seeing his young Weimaraner that, you know, it, it wasn't what he what wasn't what he um, wasn't what he wanted, right? I, I'm, I'm trying to think of her name, Rachel and Rachel Coffee, and mm, why can't I think of her husband's name? I'm losing it. Well, it's because I'm old. That's why I've got so many dog stories to tell. It's because I'm old. Anyway, Rachel's husband. He said, "Oh, would I like a dog like that?" And I said, "Oh, you would. Well, I got one for you." He says, "Where? What is it?" I said. It's this dog. And he said, well, what do you mean it's this dog? I said, his dad and him are mortal enemies. Just happened to me. I've got to keep them in two different parts of the, the, the one can't go in the house. They both got to be in kennels. I can't walk them together. He didn't understand this. He's never been around dogs this much, that, that two male dogs could be enemies like this. Um, and again, not making making excuses. This was this was Zygon that, you know, he was not going to let another male dog take his place, I guess. It's anthropomorphication again. Um, what it is, is a problem that a lot of dog breeds have. And he had it full on. And uh, for the best, for my sanity, I told this guy, I, I said, you can, I, I think I might have sold him that one. Can't remember if I sold it to him or gave it to him. Anyway, so... I know his history. I know where he lived. I know where he died. In fact, these same people ended up getting one of my other dogs down the road you'll hear about. But anyway, that was Tonzer and Frankie, all sold because of I had, a, I had this favorite dog of mine that had all the talent, all the cooperation, unfortunately none of the, none of the good canine manners, and took me from a no point sixty eight prize N.A. day to a damn near passing the invitational dog. So... Don't judge a book by its cover when you look at your NA scores sometimes. Trust me. You got to learn to read the dog. Now, all this time, okay, I've been researching Broncos, and Artie comes into my life. Artie, I found out in Colorado. It was from uh, Dan and Lane Coon, or Dan Coon and Lane Conrad. I can't remember. Anyway. Uh, they were one of the few Brocco breeders in the country. Uh, they had a questionnaire to fill out, blah, 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 blah. There's was, was a lot of hoops to jump through. But I had some money burning in my pocket from, I didn't just go, you know, buy something when, when I sold Frankie. This whole thing came in, in one year. So I had that money kind of sitting on the side. You know, again, is that uh, what we call the money you earn on the side? You tell it? Play money, side money, money you don't have to count for? You know what I mean. Anyway. I find out, my God, these dogs are how much? Well, I got it burned in a hole in my pocket, and I got to do something with it. And I take a leap, and I get Artie. Now, the, the background of that is most of you do know that I've told it on stories. I helped a friend, the, my friend Bill, with a Brocco rescue. Dog didn't turn out. It ended up living at my neighbor Jerry's, which is where Jeff and I trained all those years. Jerry put in an 1,800-foot runway, 100, foot, 100 yards wide, with a pond, and we had our pigeon quails out there. We had everything we needed right across the street there. And I ended up giving that dog to Jerry because he wanted a dog that would just sit around and keep him company. Well, that dog was fine, perfect. But the dog was a clown. And the more the dog came out of his shell, the more of a clown he was. And that's where I let, went down the path of Artie. So I got Artie, got my first Brocco. I had a fly to Denver, rent a car. No, fly to Denver then Durango, then rent a car, drive the back of no side Colorado, pick this pup, go back, spend a night in Durango, get to Denver, 
fly a jumper into Denver. I got, little, I got already in a little under-the-seat carrier. I'm at the Denver airport. I got everybody in the world looking at her with her big brown ears and her cute little face and her doy to doy to doy. Um, and she was, Artie was like getting queenie, okay? Uh, she did not have any testing in her background. I dug into her background. Her background didn't even have a, a dog that had a hunting picture with it. Now, they were from hunting lines, but you could not show me a picture of Artie's mom and dad with a dead bird in her mouth. I mean, like a dead pheasant or a dead quail or, or a sage grouse or woodcock, you know. I mean, they did a little pigeon work here and there. But, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a total crapshoot. But she was, just like, she was just like Queenie. She just worked for me. I remember one of my first times I was taking her somewhere and a deer come out of the side of the woods, out of the side of the road, and I was walking her. We were in a, what we call in a certain areas of the country, like a, a, I guess like a national park or a state park. There wasn't a lot of traffic, but the dogs have to be on leash in the state park. So on the way out, some of these state park roads are, you know, mile long, and I pull off in this little cul-de-sac, and I let her out, and she's running around going pee and poop, pee and poop, and, or I'm waiting for her to poop. And up pops this deer that was just bedded down there. And she starts chasing it. And I said, Artie, no. Dog put on the brakes, came right back to me. I'm like, well, I either scared the hell out of her and she'll never hunt. Or she literally understands that that displeased me. She was just like Queenie in that way. She just had the cooperation. She didn't have as much drive. You know, I took her through N.A., skated through that. I will tell you. She didn't want to go in the water, and I'm getting close to t test time, and I knew she could track, and I knew she would point. No problem with the field search. No problem with her nose. She just didn't want to go in the water for a bumper. And somebody told me, well, what are you using bumpers? If she doesn't like bumpers, what are you using bumpers for? I said, well, because they're going to use bumpers. He goes, I know they're going to use bumpers in the test, but they're going to go to a bird. If you don't get the bumper done, you're, you've got an opportunity to go for a bird, and you're going to at least pass the test. And that was another time, another lesson learned, like, yeah, what, why am I going to do something that could have an adverse effect on the dog? So every you got a dog that doesn't want to go in for bumpers. I'm not going to force this dog on the table. I'm not going to train retrieve it when it's a puppy. I'm not going to ask it to ask it to do something different. That's the definition of insanity, something over and over again. And I went right to pigeons with her, live pigeons. And she would dive into the water, not like Donka. Not, not like Desi. She didn't dive six feet, but she, had, she went into water with authority. I mean, she charged. Did that three or four times, did that, and then I ended up going with a dead pigeon three or four times, three or four times. And this fella told me, do not throw a bumper for your dog. You keep working with these dead pigeons. And he said, you watch what will happen. And I said, what's going to happen? He says, well, she's either going to get a two in water because she's going to go for the dead chucker or quail that they're going to hand you. Or she's going to go for a bumper because everything you've thrown for her for the last month is what she likes. And he said, you pick up that bumper on that ground. They're going to they're be a little pile of bumpers there. That, and I, of course, I've been a judge quite a few years now. I know how it works. But sometimes another guy that just stands on the outside and helps you is a big help. It, it, again, peel off another lens of those rose-colored glasses. Look at what you got. Think about it, right? He said, if you do nothing but throw birds for that dog on test day, there's no way in the world she's going to think that you're throwing a bumper. Now, he said, she might not go in for the second bumper, but she might. And son of a gun on her test day, I grabbed a bumper off the stack, and he told me, he says, you wiggle that and you get animated. You don't let her focus on what's in your hand. You just wiggle it around, wiggle it around, have fun, toss it in the water, and watch her go. And sure enough... Boom. She went in there and got it, came back. I took it back out of her mouth. Wiggle, 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 tease it. Bam, boom. Right there. She did it. She passed her score. I think she was a max or a 110. I think I always get 110s. So I'm always like the bridesmaid. But learned a big lesson there with that dog. And that was a dog that didn't want to go do duck search. Great field search. Didn't want to do duck search. Now, I knew she liked birds. I knew she liked water. Living in Virginia all these years, if I had a better place to practice, maybe could have got it with her. 
But I noticed something about her. She didn't like a lot of training. She didn't take to it. And I think a mistake that so many people make is the fact that that has to be eight interruptions. This has got to be a record. Anyway, learn if you've got a dog that you're seeing shuts down somewhere, don't keep pushing the dog. She was a dog that would anybody be happy with. Again, anybody could take her hunting. I had friends take her hunting. She would, you could have somebody come over to the house, let her out. They'd call her back in. She did not want to be trained for high-level obedience. And it, that was a dog that taught me, like, wow, you can have all the talent in the world. It doesn't mean you want to be a test dog. And that's, all these dogs have taught me things that, that they, and they, and they link together. And there's, there's correlation between that dog and this dog and that dog. And you start seeing it pop up more often. And you're like, yeah, that's what I got. Now, that's a hard thing for me to talk people into when they got their first dog. And I see it doing things like this. I'm like, tell you what, if you're going to go further with your dog, let her grow up a little bit. Let her have a lot more fun. Quit making. That's like when I was in school. Making me read a book was like asking me to walk barefoot on gravel. I couldn't do either. I didn't like either. I, 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 when I'd have to walk across the alley in Chicago, we called them cinders. That was a black volcanic rock that they used for, for the rocks in the alley. They weren't black on your hands. They didn't make your hands dirty. But they were black, ground up, I don't know, lava or something. They called them cinders. Or maybe it came from the steel mills. I don't know what it was, but if I had to cross that alley barefoot as a kid, it was out, ooh, out. Now, some of my friends, Ricky in particular, he could run down the alley barefoot. I couldn't, okay? All of us have different sensitivities. All these dogs have different sensitivities. Learning, learning what you can do with a dog is going to make your years when you have this plaque someday that you're going to do, because I know a lot of you are going to want to want to see this plaque, and I'm going to put it up on Instagram, and I'm going to put it up on my Patreon page. And I'm telling you, if you've been at it for a while, you're going to want one of these just to remember all these dogs, and, and I'm not done with dogs yet, but Artie was a dog that taught me, okay, you might not be a test dog. You've got good genetics, but you're not a test dog. Now, I took Bravo. Bravo comes along the line, right? Now, of course, at this point, I still got Zygon. I've had to get rid of Tonzer and Frankie. Um, Desi, I buried in the backyard of uh, Virginia. She had a mass and had a great vet down there in Virginia. Says, you could spend a lot of money, Ron, but I know what this is going to be. It's going to be surgery. And it's going to be a death sentence. And unless you want to send this dog off to Caltech and do chemo, I said, no, ma'am. And it's funny, this vet, she was an old German woman, older than me. I was probably 50 at the time or something. And uh, she was older than me. She's from Germany. She told me she had a picture of her at home with German wire hairs when she was a kid. So that would have been like 1930s, right? 40s maybe. And uh, she, she said, it's your call. I said, no, no, it's your call. You're the vet. I'm paying you to be the vet. And uh, we put her down. And uh, so I've still got Zygon, and I got Artie, and now I want to get into the Brocco world because I love Artie's personality. And I love my neighbor's Brocco that just, they're just clowns. They're not... I don't need a high-powered dog. I love a high-powered dog, as long as it's under control. And I don't really like high-level training. You know, I did it once. I've done it with a few other dogs. I got Bravo through his utility test. So, yeah, you got to put some pressure on a dog. I could tell that when I got Bravo, I imported him through Hungary from Esoy, Esoy Gabor, like, like Gabor, like Zsa, Zsa Gabor. Esoy Gabor, and luckily his wife is fluent and speaks and writes and reads English. He breeds and hunts Broncos in Hungary. And I met him on Facebook, said I'd like to get a dog, and I got Bravo from his litter. Now I got Bravo, and I was like, holy cow, I got my second Zygon. Except Zygon had more talent. Bravo had more cooperation right off the bat. And loved other dogs. He could care less about other dogs. Now, I'm going to go back into real quick all the wire hairs. On top of everything else, just the fighting with the other dogs. Yeah, 
there's the, the cats, the deer, the fawns, the time that Hasco stalked a calf cow in Texas on a test like he was going to pounce on it. it so you got to remember, I, 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 went, I went normal, short hair world. Ooh, I got to have wire hairs. I got to have the grrr. I got to have the dog that can do it all. And I love a dog that can do it all, but he's got to do it. If he's going to if he's gonna do a do-it-all dog, he's got to be everything, home, life. And they're out there. Trust me, I've met a few of them. I know some people that have wire hairs right now that I would take home because I already know what they're like. They're already grown. I'm just not going to roll the dice on it, right? So now I got Bravo. He comes in, puppy, not much of a puppy because he was so big and they didn't dock his tail. So he looked like he was five foot long when he was a puppy. And I took him down to Florida to visit my buddy Jerry. I had one other dog ready with me, and that was Gracie. That was a puppy I kept out of Artie and Cider. Cider was owned by John Calacy in Illinois. I dropped off Artie to be bred to Cider. And literally, I'll never forget it. We put him in the yard. They didn't do anything. Danced around. And John, John had the, a house in the yard, a facility, and a kennel to keep Artie. And that's the only way I would do it. You know, I was like, I, I don't want to go there and wait in the yard for two hours and then go there the next day till these dogs bred. Well, I said, well, maybe she's just embarrassed to do it in front of her dad. And John laughed. And um, I no more than got on the Indiana Toll Road. I wasn't 20 minutes from John's house. He says, we got a tie. I said, what? <laughs> he says, yeah, they're tied up in the backyard. She was waiting for you to leave. She didn't want her dad to see her having sex for the first time. Anyway, I got a dog out of her. That, uh, that, was, that was great. I believe it was Gracie. Boy, there's a blur of dogs in my life. Uh, we're getting toward the end, though. That was Gracie. So I had Gracie, and now I got Bravo. And I'm getting Gracie ready for her N.A. test. So I'm in Florida, you know, Michigan, everything. The water's frozen. Virginia, the water's ice cold. Florida, I'm down by the St. John's River. And I'm trying to get Gracie to go in for bumpers. And she was half good about it. She wasn't like her, she wasn't like her mom. She was, she was better than her mom. She didn't need to go right to a pigeon. Took a little convincing how to make it fun for her. And I had Jerry sitting there. Jerry's drinking a beer, sitting on the, on the back of At that point, I was driving. Some of you have seen me in these little transit flower trucks. And a lot of you had a lot of fun with it. And so have I. We got the door spread open. And he's sitting on the, on the flat back of it. And I said, just hang on to Bravo for me. And of course, Jerry went to grab a beer and light a cigarette. And off goes Bravo. Well, Bravo sees me out to boat launch. He goes zooming past me and just starts swimming out into the middle of the St. John's River like he was on a freaking search. And I'm like, holy shit. And I remember going like, that dog's not going to have a problem in the water. And I'll never forget, there was a lady's house, one house, like one lot over from this boat launch. And she said, sir, I don't want to tell you what to do, but you know, we have alligators in the water. They're not real active this time of year, but I've seen them, I've seen them swimming in the river. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I'm like, Bravo. He doesn't know his name yet. I just got him off the plane three weeks ago. And Bravo, Bravo, come back, come back. And he sees me, turns around. I throw a bumper up on land for him because I had bumpers down at the water for Gracie. And he goes and picks up that bumper, grabs it again, comes back to me, Hands it to me, like hands me the bumper. I'm like, oh my God, you, you said there's something good about you. <laughs> this, is, this is a keeper. So I get them both out of the St. John's River. No more, no more alligator water. Um, I can't remember if Gracie went on and passed her test or not. I do not remember if that was the case or not. But anyway, Gracie didn't, she was just quirky. And that's another thing. A lot of people, a lot of people can't get rid of a dog, and I understand it. You buy a dog, you got one dog, and like, okay, it didn't hunt. I know people have kept dogs till they they're 13 years old. They were gun shy, but they love them. God bless them. I come from a little bit more of like, okay, I could maybe keep a dog. If it got a little older, I always keep them when they get older. You know, and like, hey, you can grow old and die with me. I don't care. But when they're younger and they don't have what it takes, I did not want them in my breeding program. And I find homes for them. And they're, Gracie went to Rachel also, same home that had Tonser. She loved that dog. Gracie loved, I think, Gracie and another one, Hope, that I had. It was the H litter. 
No, it wasn't Nature Litter. We called her. Her name was something else. I, I called her Hope because one day I said, well, I hope she does better than Gracie or something like that. Hope was a runaway dog. Great around a kennel, great around people. I think no problem with water. No, But same thing with uh, Donka. Legs like springs. Up and over a fence, out, and if she had another dog with her, they were gone. Like she could talk another dog into taking a run. If she jumped the fence by herself, she was literally within an acre of my house. I'd come home from work, she'd be in the backyard. I'd come from the back pipeline, she'd be looking at me. If she could get another dog to go out with her or stumble over a fence or one of them dug under once, like Zeno, Zeno was another one. Now, Zeno's not going to go on my board because, for one, he's still alive and he lives with a friend out in Washington or out 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 west, Washington State, Oregon. I sorry, sorry, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I don't consider Zeno my dog, although Zeno was a dog I intended to do stuff with. He was a good water dog. He ran away with he ran away with uh, Hope one time, and lo and behold, next day I'm out of town. I had to go to work, not out of town, out of town, just like past Grand Rapids was an overnight. And guess what? He digs under. Hope jumps over. He digs under. They go find a porcupine. My wife has now people coming over here to look at another dog or a litter of dogs to meet the breed, and she's got two dogs, Hope with a handful of porcupine quills in Zeno covered from testicles to tongue. My vet, Tiffany, told me that from what she can tell, this dog either ran over it accidentally or tried to hump it after he tried to kill it. She goes, I'd never pulled out that many porcupine quills out of a dog's testicles and in, 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 in penis. Just period. That was just how she put it. And she took pictures to prove it. And those pictures are in one of Steve Brunello's books. Anyway, this is where I'm going. So Artie's on the board for sure. Okay. Hope went to another home. She went down to a friend in North Carolina. Absolutely worked for that woman way better than she ever worked for me. She went on to become... Show dog, AKC Junior. She, she had all. She liked being with. I don't care what anybody says. Either I did something wrong in the beginning, or she took a liking to females over males. And I've heard this a hundred times. I, I don't think you could prove it. And and I don't know if you can get over it, but I've also heard sometimes when a dog just goes to a new home, especially when they're younger, it's like Control Alt Delete on the old computers. It's like let's clear it. Let's start over. And both of those dogs went on to have wonderful lives. They will not be on my board, but they're a couple of my favorites. Favorites that I had to give away, Hope and Gracie, like Tonsa and Frankie. Well, now we still got Bravo. Bravo, you, you, I'm coming up to all the last seven years. Bravo's 11 or 12 now, so most of you know Bravo. You've seen him on television. You used to see Artie on television on Meat Eater on the dove hunting episode. You saw Bravo and couple other episodes. So people kind of know his history. I, he's my clown. He's my big boy. He's my go-to. He's getting too old. Okay. He's getting too old to run hard. He's a big dog. He's got a place right now. He's on a futon mattress curled up. You know what? He's going to look like that in real life one day. And he's going to look like that one day when I walk out into the kennel and won't be any different than today. He, he's done everything I needed a dog to do and more. I can, do, I can do tricks with them. I can make them hold things. I can, make, I can dress them up like a, like a whatever, like a, like a flapper dancer if I wanted to. He would go along with anything, and that's what I love about him. Now, we've got to jump up to Miller. I did a breeding with Bravo with uh, Katie and Shirley's dog, and we had a litter of five and a litter of two, and I had... Oscar, and I think it was Katie. Yeah, yeah, because I named Katie after Katie. Yeah, thanks, Katie. You're listening to this. I know you are. If not, surely listen to it and tell Katie to listen to it. This dog, Katie, was named after Katie. I've always loved the name Katie. I don't know why. Never dated one, but I love the name Katie. Probably because of John Wayne when uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn. And uh, I just like the name Kate, Katie. Just love it. So Katie and Oscar... I think I did a whole episode about that. Now, they're going to be on the board, of course. They were the ones that I took down to Indiana when I was 
probably about five, six years ago, and I was going to use them for a George Hickox demo of some raw dogs, raw talent, some issues they both have, but, you know, he could work with. And I was going down to audit the class like I did in Bozeman with him. And so he invites me to come over, and I film a little bit of it, and I interview him, and it's some of the stuff I love doing. And that's the terrible night back in the day, for those of you who are new to the show, that uh, my buddy Gary was with me from Evansville, Indiana, and he brought a dog, and I brought Miller, Katie and Oscar, and old Bravo. He wasn't even old then. Bravo slept in the back seat. Katie and Oscar, we were walking the dogs after dinner, and Katie and Oscar got off for about two, three minutes, always came back when I called, but they were, they were running pretty big, maybe a couple hundred yards out in these woods. Well, Katie and Oscar, in the morning when I got up, 9 o'clock I put them in their kennel, uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, there was no more Katie and Oscar. They were both uh, stone dead. Both got poisoned. We still never found out the exact item that poisoned them. It was not likely blue, blue algae because that doesn't happen that early in the year. Um, it was likely not something that was just an insecticide because uh, this is a state park and they didn't use any of these things. And it could have very well likely been something that had fermented over the summer or over the winter. Um, and they both drank it and they both died just like that. Uh, it was so those two, Katie and Oscar. They're probably going to have, probably going to put their pictures on that one. They just, uh, they were special. That was my next breeding pair of dogs in the Bracco world, and and they were testing well. In fact, I think uh, Katie, Katie got a 112, and my daughter's dog Zuzu uh, got a 110 that day. I ran two Broncos. In fact, Katie was uh, the only Bracco that I knew of at the time that was six months old, and and could even pass the Navda naturability test. Your average Bracco at six months is still tripping on their ears. Not not Katie. Katie took after her dad when it came. To, I watched her one afternoon. I was throwing bumpers for Bravo in the back pond here just for a little fun to do, something to do, keep him occupied. And she was sitting on the hill. My daughter was had her camera out. And uh, she watched her dad go in that water. And the next time I threw that bumper, she ran past her dad and went in the water. I'm like, oh, my God, it, the genes passed on, and I got the right one. Because, you know, when you have a litter of dogs, you don't know what they're going to be at eight weeks. You can guess all you want. You know what color they're going to be, and you know what patches are going to be brown and white. That's all you know. I don't care what anybody says. You can't guarantee it. And uh, unfortunately, Katie and Oscar died that day way too early. And Miller, who I did not trust to be around running with Katie and Oscars, I kept him on a check cord up by the truck because he was a little asshole, basically. And I didn't feel like blowing the whistle and calling for him. So he didn't get into what they got into. And Bravo, by nature of his, I cannot help but meet people and hang on people. Bravo's like me. He's never met a stranger. When Gary was at the tailgate, he drove up a little late and met me when I was feeding the dogs. He had met Bravo before. Gary's got a dog out of me, or had a dog from me. And uh, that's where he got his first Bravo from. And uh, when Bravo sees you, if you pet him, that's, that's it. That's all you need to do. You pet him, and he leans on you, and he drools on you, and you pet him some more, and you move your hand, he hits your hand. He's like, no, you got to keep petting me. So Bravo never ran around with Katie and Oscar. So that's why that happened. So Katie and Oscar go on the board. Miller, Miller never turned into what <laughs> his potential could have been, and he had some kind of a, I'm going to say, I, we're not going to go into Miller, I had to put him down last year. And I think I put that on the episode. I can't remember if that was one of my, I wrote that, uh, did a little, little what you call it to. We're wrapping up here. We're getting close to the end, okay? Miller's gone. He was a nice, great disposition. Although Miller and my daughter's lab fought and fought again. And then we said, no way. And we kind of tested it. Oh, yeah. So there's a Bracco and a Labrador that became mortal enemies. So this stuff happens, okay? So we had to keep them to apart. And then uh, at the same time, right when I lost Katie and Oscar, Zara came into my life. Zara was, there was a show breeder of Broncos that uh, didn't hunt, but I think they were going to do hunt tests. But they were, this is what happens with a lot of breeds. You know, they get popular in a show ring. Well, in Europe, 
it's confirmation in hunting are usually hand in hand in most cases. Don't, don't, don't write me emails if you know an example of it not. I'm saying it's a lot more common there than it is here to have a show, a bench champion, and a field champion. And so this dog came out of the same kennel that Bravo came from or the same lines that Bravo came from. And this lady called me up. Somebody knew about me losing those two dogs and needing breeding stock. And she said, I imported two dogs recently, dogs a year old or less than a year old. She goes, I would part with this one. You know, we come up with a price, just like, you know, normal price for, well, for a Bracco. Um, and nowadays for any dog. And uh, you, this this one, this one is, uh, uh, you, you won't even believe this. I, I, we're not going to get into Zara. Zara's with me. I'm going to stick it out with her. I, I think she's a little bit barn sour, and that's on me. Because then in the meantime, I got Taffy, and Taffy got all my attention. Anyway. Nothing wrong with Zara. She's a fine dog. She may go to someone's home someday, and she may live out the rest of her years here because I like her that much. She's a sweetheart. She does eat things like a goat, though. Many Broncos would eat tin cans, batteries. Bravo doesn't for some reason. He could care. He'll chew a stick up. You could leave a sock on the ground. That dog won't do it. All my other dogs, yeah. I mean, don't leave anything that smells like human around them. Anyway, Zara, I got her all the way down in southern Georgia, damn near to the Florida border. Drove through the day into the night. Like I said, no, I'm going to make, no, actually, no, I stopped at Beer Mountain, Virginia, slept a few hours, got back in the car like 4 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock. I mean, I just literally took a four-hour nap at my house in Virginia, kept going, blew into Georgia, down there. I call this lady 8 o'clock at night. And tell her I'm going to be there the next day. And, I'm, and I didn't know it was 8 o'clock at night. Yeah, 8, 8 p.m. at night. I talked to her. Then sent a text. Said, okay, I need your address. Uh, for some reason, I couldn't find it. It was, wasn't where I wrote it down. Anyway, got her address. Double check it. And then I was like, yep, that's right. I remember that. I know where I wrote it down. Blah, blah, blah. 8 o'clock at night. Now, I believe that's when I was at Beer Mountain, but it was only going to just power nap it and get back in the truck. I get down there somewhere around noon the next day, the, let's say Saturday, and I get there, and there's no one home. There's dogs in the backyard. There's no one home. No one. Nobody, nobody home. I'm like, that's impossible. I mean, the lady knows I'm coming. So I'm texting her, and I'm texting her. I'm calling her. I'm calling her. I'm like, hey, 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 where you at? I mean, the phone, you know, at, at one point, I thought I could hear the phone ringing in the house. Like, is that, is that me, or am I hearing the ringing on my own phone? I'm standing at the door. Finally, the door opens, and it's this lady's husband. And he says, she's not here. She's not, she's not here. I'm like, well, that's weird. He goes, are you here to pick up Zara? And I said, Yeah. He goes, all right, come on in. Um, something was fishy. Something was, and, and as you'll hear in the end of the story here, it, it was, it's like it can't happen to anybody more than once in their life, and it probably would happen to nobody ever in their life, okay? He's talking to me about the dog. We start doing some paperwork. Um, he said, and I can't remember what, I'm not even, I wouldn't say their name if I did have it, but so I'm just going to use the name Carol. Um, he said, what did Carrie tell, Carol tell you to write a check for? And I, I think it was $2,000 or something like that, whatever her money she had in the dog, or $2,500. And I said, okay, you want me to make this out to, he goes, no, make it out to me. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right. And I'm thinking, oh, that's kind of weird. Are you going to cash this check and tell her that I never showed up and stole the dog? All this stuff's running through my head. This lady fell in the bathroom right after 8 o'clock the night before and died. Hit her head and died. Yes, in her bathroom. This guy had been at the hospital all night, came home, got home in the morning, probably took some sedative to go to sleep because what husband wouldn't, you know, to try to get through this. So... In less, than, in less than 
14 hours I'm at their house after talking to her. She's gone from the night before, like 11 o'clock at night. He tells me, he tells me why, because I'm like, well, you want me, sure you don't want me to write a check to her? And then she, and she, he, he says, I'm going to have to figure out the paperwork later because she didn't sign the paperwork. I'm like, well, that's weird. And I literally said, well, where is, she, where is Carol? Again, that's a, a, AKA, also known as Carol. And he goes, she died last night. I'm like, what? Yeah, it, it's, oh, he said, I didn't even want to tell you if I didn't have to. It's just, it just brings, and he tells me the story. I'm like, oh, crime any sake, you know. So I get this dog. I've never got the papers for this dog, okay? Never got the papers for this dog. And you know what? It's okay. I think she's mediocre. <laughs> so, I, you know, I probably could find it. I probably could dig in now. It's years later, but she's probably, oh, she's not too old to breed. But anyway, so that's, that's Zara. She's still a sweetheart. still love her. And then, of course, before Zara, right after Zara came Taffy. And Taffy stole my heart with her minxy little smile and her 23-pound body. And everybody knows the story of Taffy since you've been listening to this podcast. And Itty, Itty came into my life. That's a, a liver and white Brocco Italiano that my friends Erica and, and uh, uh, oh, come on, don't. That's embarrassing. Eric and Erica, Eric and, oh, for God's sakes. Well, anyway, I'm not going to say your last name anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, so I get a call. Somebody says, do you know anybody looking for Brocco? I said, I got a friend looking for one. I'm not looking for one. And they said, well, we got this. Tell me the story about this dog. And I said, okay. Well, I'm going to be coming back from a hunting trip, and I could stop at your place, look at the dog. I'd be interested. I might be interested for my own breeding stock, or I have a friend that's dying to get one, and even if this dog doesn't hunt, this guy wants a Brocco, just like Jerry wanted that Brocco back in the day. And so... I meet the dog, and remember when I was talking about males and females, and this dog, Itty, did not like the husband to the point where in a NAVDA test, the dog got a one in search, and he ran the dog. And as a NAVDA judge, and I read this, I'm like, oh, well, that's, that dog didn't hunt. And he goes, oh, no, dog hunted. Just didn't hunt anywhere near me. <laughs> Itty did not like... The husband, the man of the house, I just call him that, right? And she was kind of intended to do both show and, you know, and field work, which, which I love people to do that with their dog because it's confirmation and performance, and that's where you get your best dogs from. Um, Itty, unfortunately, for a girl, probably would have made the choice to go, you know, transgender because she's a very masculine-looking female Brocco to the point where... I would have thought she was a male Brocco. She's very jolly. She's very necky. She's short neck. She's, there's no refined female look to this dog whatsoever. But she's a sweetheart. But I did realize that sometimes a new owner is a press reset button, control, alt, delete. Because Itty, although it took her a year to do it, you heard me last week on the last, or two weeks ago, how when I took her to North Dakota and gave her her head, let her do something, no corrections, no nothing. All of a sudden, poof, she's like, you're my, you're my hunting partner. I'm hunting for you now. And boom. Yeah. So you know the story of Itty. I, I probably told the story before. Of course, Itty be a long time, hopefully, before she ever makes the plaque. And Nick Rufus of Tagus. Well, everybody knows about Nick Rufus of Tagus. The problem is nobody knows what his name is. It was Nick. He's the color of Rufus. And after my last trip to North Dakota, I thought, the ghost town of Tagus. What a great name for a dog. I don't want any of you to steal it. So right now, he's Nick Rufus of Tagus. Not a lot to tell you about him, except that I'm going to be taking him through, as you can imagine, all the Upland Institute training. Now, of course, I'm going to blend in more versatile stuff with tracking and water, which you'll see down the road in other formats, but I started right off the bat with him waiting at the gate, waiting at the food. My friends Trent and Heather watched him for a, a week and a half while I was gone, kept working it with the food. This little dog, when you put the early work in, 
They don't need they don't need to go find a bird yet. They need to know who they are in the family, where they fit, and who's the boss. And not in a mean way. Just understand. You know, when I was a kid and a bell would ring, we would bolt out the doors at Owen School. I mean those doors would big giant oak doors would fly open and kids would just boil out, right? But I'll tell you what, if Mrs. Coughlin and Mrs. Spain were at the door because some kid got hit by the door the day before and they didn't want us to do that, miraculously, we filed out the door and still had as much fun in the playground as we were going to have. See where I'm going? We still had the fun in the playground. We just didn't need to bust the door open. And that's a lot of the stuff I learned from Justin with the Upland Institute. These little subtle, wait here, wait here, give him the okay. This dog, if I open his kennel right now, he looks at me, and I say, no, it took a few slaps in the face and a few no's. I, I do believe he's a very intelligent dog. For those of you who are brand new, he's a wire-haired Vishla. Um, very tickled with him. But already, just the manners. I, I, I let him have his head outside. Inside, just a couple of manners, like Mrs. Coughlin and Mrs. Spain did to us in grade school. Like, you know what? You can be a little heathen. Or what we want in a dog, we want a high-desire dog. But you can still walk out of the school calmly without knocking anybody down the stairs. So there you go. Sandy, JD, uh, Queenie, Haskell, Cora, Desi, Donka, Zygon, Frankie, Tonzer, Artie. They're all going on the list. They're all going on the plaque. Bravo, he's still with me. Hope and Gracie. They're gone, but they're not on my plaque. They're on other people's plaques and memories. Katie and Oscar, definitely on my plaque. Miller, right next to Bravo on the plaque someday, or Bravo will be next to him. Zara, we don't know what she's going to be. She could be a real late bloomer. Or she could just be the kennel dog that everybody loves. Taffy, she's the heathen. I'll have all those names made up because those names will be on the plaque along with Itty and Nick Rufus of Tagus. All of them will be. Anyway, look on Instagram. I'll have a picture of the plaque. Look on the po podcast episodes. I'll be using it a few times. Thank you to Nick Hebner for doing that, coming up with that idea, or borrowing the idea from somebody else. I can't remember how you found it, Nick. Thank you for sending me this plaque with that beautiful, inspirational quote about owning a dog and the idea of having that plaque up there. At one point, I wanted pictures, 8 by 10s all the way around the top of my kennel of all the dogs I've had. But I realized, you know, I don't have great pictures. I got good ones now. But some of them are just little pictures from Polaroid cameras. And I'm like, oh, that's not, I, I need good pictures. Um, so that's where my dogs, that's going to be where they're memorialized on this plaque with a beautiful quote from George Bird Evans which you heard me read, and I won't read it again because right now I'm thinking about all those dogs that are not with me, and someday the dogs I'm looking at statistically won't be with me either. But hopefully you as a listener will be with me. More people will be with us listening. More people will be coming on the Zoom rooms. More people will be getting into the dog world, and I'll be there to help you with it as much as I can. Hunting Dog Podcast will be there for you forever until my name's on the plaque. That's right. I love you guys. I love you girls. And I love this world of dogs and people. You know what I said? There's dogs and people I've known. There's dogs and people I have met. And there's dogs and pe or there's dog that I've yet to meet. And now I screwed that whole one up. You know what I mean. You know what I'm saying. You've heard me say it before. And there's dogs and people I've yet to meet. I'm still hopefully yet to meet in a few. I put a few away. And I'm in the company of some great ones right now. Thanks. Talk to you soon.